take a journey with me. Now, I can't promise an obstacle-free experience because I've never really been great at directions. But what I can promise is that we'll end up somewhere different than where we started. Are you ready? Yeah. To bleed betrayal. She fought to bring her son into her warm embrace, not unlike any of her children. How she treasured him. She sang melodies in the breeze through canopies of leaves, wrapping him in hand-woven love, fed him from her own fields, and delighted in him as he grew. She embraced his bare feet with her red earth, held him strong, high in the branches of the mango tree, rocked him gently to the murmur of grasshoppers and frogs. And he trusted her, imagining no other life without her. She raised him in the breath of her stories, danced through him in the rhythm of her drum, watched over him in the stars of the Southern Cross. And she was a part of him, and he a part of her. She wept over him in the midst of the rainy season, particularly on the night he had to leave. She always wept when she lost a child. War, the darkest thread in the flaw of the human condition, sent many of her babies to faraway lands. Her hope in a distant reunion kept her tears from washing everything away. And as he entered the hollow hidden bird with stiff wings, he felt a piece of himself rip away and stay with the only mother he ever knew. He breathed deeply the humidity of her soft embrace, promising his mother an imminent return with money, education, gifts, new ideas, and an abundance that would spill over. He promised to carry home a solution that would bring his mother peace, redeem her efforts, and make her strong. What she did not know was that she simply traded her child from one war to another. Disconnected time faded his mother's memories, how she raised him, cared for him, how the rhythm of the drum fell in step with the beating of his heart. In this unfamiliar land, a new woman embraced him, but her touch was cold. She spoke of many things, money, cars, sex, drugs, power, and this faded his promise. Time stole and replaced, untied and unleashed, an acceptance of things unimagined. And now he lays upon a foreign woman who never cared to know him. Her ways seemed so alluring and reminded him of his mother, but she had no heart. He traded his promise for a lie dressed in green paper. The violence is inevitable, predictable, more real than the power he sought. His blood spills out and turns the soil red, red on this black earth. And in this moment, this too late moment, he realizes he bleeds betrayal. Mother Africa still waits, for she knows not the fate of her son. I'm driving to a gravesite with four Sudanese young men in my car on a warm September night one year ago, and this poem is writing itself in my head as I'm living out one of the many strange and unpredictable moments of life I often find myself in. I don't know these four young men very well, but they need a ride. It's the one-year anniversary of their 17-year-old cousin's murder. He was fatally stabbed on the streets of Winnipeg five years after arriving here. These boys know murder. They were born into civil war and have lived to tell haunting stories of survival. They understand death on a level I can't. But I began to realize that they had not experienced this same kind of robbery in their new home until their cousin's death. I'm driving and wondering how this sheltered little white girl who grew up tucked away in a Winnipeg suburb is driving to a cemetery with people who have lived a life almost opposite to mine. This situation is very different from those I grew up in. 
and one my family would have probably laid an egg over if they had known at the time what I was doing. <laughs> Driving refugee youth from the inner city, who I didn't really know that well, to a grave site in the dark. Like I said, I've never really been great at directions. And I think my family and friends thought I took a major wrong turn when I intentionally moved from the suburbs to downtown Winnipeg in an area known for gang violence and crack deals. Despite knowing the risks of the area and my lack of street smarts, there was just something within me that reassured my spirit that this was not a wrong turn or a detour at all. This was an intentional change in direction that has awakened me to the heartbeat of this city through the newcomer experience. Living downtown afforded me opportunities I would have never had in my childhood suburb. Opportunities like building relationships with refugee youth transitioning here. As these relationships developed, so did our trust in one another, and I began to see and understand the serious obstacles facing newcomers and our failure as a collective to support them. The transition from war and conflict to life in Winnipeg bears stories that are patiently waiting for willing listeners. And so we drive. One of the four new Canadian youth in the car is Matoir. I must introduce Matoir into this story now because the relationship you develop with him will become the lifeboat of sustainable change that will rest within you long after this moment passes. Matoir is a Sudanese refugee in his early 20s. He's been living in Winnipeg for six years, and he is now one of my best friends. Matoir and I struck up an unlikely friendship, unlikely in the sense that when I first met him, I didn't really like him. He was loud, overwhelming, and kind of a jerk. He did a great job at keeping people at arm's length with his bravado, but there was just something about this young man who looked and acted so different than me that I couldn't walk away from. As over time, um, as our relationship developed, I began to understand a little bit more about Matoir. And with that understanding and trust came the stories. Stories when war came to Sudan, bringing with it guns, landmines, and aerial bombings. Matoir tells me a story. When the plane engines were heard overhead, everyone knew what to do. Matoir ran for a makeshift bunker, a hole in the ground with the sky stretched over it. He was told not to look up in case the people in the plane saw his eyes and dropped a bomb directly on them. He describes the coolness of the mud in the ground in contrast with the intense heat of the blast that is soon to follow. He talks about the mud flying in all directions, covering the hole, burying him and his family alive. Yes, he is still alive, hidden under his grandmother's legs and layers of mud. Matoir sighs. He has just told me the story of the day his grandmother died. As we drive, I see the light from the street lamps wash over Matoir, and I think to myself how different he must look now compared to the boy who left Sudan. The escalating war forced his parents to send him to live with his uncle in Kenya as he had been named a future child soldier along with many other boys in the community. When Matoir's uncle was given the opportunity to come to Canada, Matoir went with him, leaving his family and friends in the uncertainty of life in Sudan. As a refugee, Matoir did not have the choice to leave his family and home behind. War and genocide made that choice for him. He could not go home. He had to make a new home. And that place would be called Winnipeg. Poverty and isolation met Matoir here. He told me he was confused by Canadian culture and thought he would fit in right away. He was beyond disappointed when he realized he didn't fit in at all. Isolated and confused, it didn't take long before this vulnerability was exploited. The first time Matoir sold drugs, he didn't even know what was happening. In fact, he was elated because he had finally made new friends and he thought they were including him in a game they were playing. At the end of the game, when Matoir got free money and nothing bad happened, he continued selling. He had friends now and money to buy the things he thought he needed in order to fit in. By the time Matoir realized that the world he had entered was not a game at all, he could not bear the thought of being alone again. 
When Matoir entered my life, the street had already stolen so much from him. He was tangled in a world he longed to get out of, but just kept pulling him back in. He used drugs and alcohol as a form of pain management to dull the things he had seen and done. Ashamed and not able to understand Matoir's behavior, the adult relatives he had in the city turned their backs on him, driving him closer to the very people he needed to run from. He told me that no matter how hard he tried, he could never achieve what he desired most, to fit in. And when you can't fit, you rage. Desensitized by war back home and the images on TV here, violence became a comfortable way to get what was needed and claim perceived ownership over things. The survival skills taught from the conflict in Africa spill onto our city streets, making it much harder to trick ourselves into thinking that what's happening an ocean away doesn't really affect us. It was the the process of watching his friends and family become enslaved by the court system and revolving jail doors that motivated Matoir to start thinking about changing his life in his new home. And it's this violence that has us driving to a cemetery. By the time we got to the gravesite, the gates were locked and we weren't able to visit the burial spot. It seemed like too profound a moment to just get back in the car and drive away. So we joined hands in a circle. We prayed. We stared into the cement and silently gave each other the freedom to let tears fall. I didn't have the privilege to know the young man who lay in the ground next to us, but I felt the pain and searing loss of his family. It was a pain I've rarely experienced with them again, but I began to realize that they carry this with them all the time. I had witnessed a defining moment in the transitioning experience of these young newcomers, and it motivated me to start asking questions I had never thought to ask before. Are we effectively helping refugees find their place in their new home? Did refugees just survive war and genocide to die on our soil? Will we let them bleed? I find myself wondering if refugees are just being relocated from one war to another under the guise of a better life. From bullets and bombs at home to being murdered, lured by gangs, and numbed by drugs and alcohol here. It seems like the isolation and splintering of community required to drive this all-consuming, ravenous beast of more that we have been led to believe will bring about contentment and a worthwhile life actually creates a perfect storm for all people, including newcomers. This is not their culture. This is our culture that breeds this kind of dysfunction. We have traded human relationships, which are messy and sometimes painful, for convenience and money. We've sped up the pace of life so fast that I wonder how long our endurance will last. Most days, I feel like I can barely keep up, and I know I'm just getting started. And that thought makes me more tired. I was watching the TV show Mad Men the other day, and the main character, Don Draper, who rarely causes me to respond to his behavior in any other way except why, Draper, why, said something that struck me. He said, we are flawed because we want so much more. We are ruined because we get these things and we wish for what we had. I think we're ruined because we get these things and we realize it's not enough. But instead of evaluating the process, we just keep striving for more things, often at the expense of our deepest hopes, which are usually non-material. Have we become refugees in our own society, in the pursuit of unattainable goals, with the intoxication of pleasure and self-serving desires? Our society has crossed value borders, displacing those who choose to put people first and personal gain last. It seems like we filled our lives with the extreme. Extreme sports, instant technology, reality television, plastic surgery, extreme diets, vacations to space. Because it's the only way we can feel something anymore. We look to these ever-increasing ridiculous situations to try to provide some semblance of meaning because we've devalued human relationships to such a point 
that we've lost much of the benefits. The transition process of newcomers holds a mirror up to our culture and shows us the depth of our brokenness. It's not about building the capacity of jails. It's about building the capacity of our relationships that bring about change. It's not about labels. It's about changing our language to recognize the potential in people, going from youth at risk to youth at promise. It's not about funding a harder punitive stance on crime and sacrificing support to nonprofit programs that connect with people in a fundamental way. Change happens in the context of relationship. Today you met Matoir. You didn't know him before, but now you do. It is my hope that within the context of this new relationship, it will become impossible to look at the newcomer experience and the situations happening here the same. It is time for a reawakening of collective conscience, a collective conscience that relinquishes apathy and reaches out to offer tangible solutions of mentorship, volunteerism, and engaged dialogue, a change that puts people first, a unity where the hands of community catch those who are falling instead of the justice system. People attribute the things that I'm saying to youthful idealism. This is not idealism. This is what it means to be fully human. And we've forgotten that along the way. But it's okay. Because life has this beautiful way of reminding us what's important. I believe that moment is before us right now. But just in case we need something to remind us of this moment in the future, Please turn to one of your neighbors. Go ahead. Can't really see you. I can't see if you're actually doing it. <laughs> now, now t I'm going to trust you. I'm going to take, take your word for it. Now take your right hand and give them a pinch. Just, just pinch them. <laughs> Did you hesitate? <laughs> Did you experience a heart flutter and a stomach flop all at the same time? That's what our humanity feels like. It's that feeling, that thing, that connects us with one another, helps us notice each other, and prevents us from hurting one another. It can be easy to overlook that feeling in the bustle of daily life. But if you ever need reminding, reach out and pinch someone. Thank you.